um, have the governor come up here very shortly to uh, give some opening remarks. Uh, I will be following him uh, with just a few more. Uh, but we wanted to welcome you. Of course, this is about um, looking at our Race to the Top application this morning, uh, reviewing it, uh, comparing it to the two states that were the winners to see how we stack up. And then we're going to have a discussion uh, with you about uh, where we want to move, what are our next steps, what, we have, what do we have to do as a state um, to uh, perhaps resubmit another application. So without further ado, Governor Plenty. Good morning. Thank you for coming. We really appreciate it. As you know, we're gathered uh, as a group of stakeholders in the Race for the Top competition and application. I think all of you in the room are well familiar with round one and what was asked and what was uh, received and what the decision was from the uh, current administration. I want to just start, though, by asking you to think back to the phenomena of Nixon going to China. Uh, some of you will remember that it's cited now in uh, political and policy discussions as an example of somebody who because of, in this case, uh, his strong previous record of being anti-communist, he could take the risk of going to China and not be accused of being soft on communism. There were many others who were involved in the debate and the discussions of that time and of that era who uh, were afraid to go or were unwilling to extend the discussion or engagement to that level because they were afraid of the backlash that would come from a certain group uh, within the discussion that people were being soft on communism. And so that whole phenomena now has become known in the pop culture as it's like Nixon going to China. In other words, somebody who because of his or her strong connections or attachment to a very powerful perspective or very powerful uh, group or the, with the possibility of consequences was willing to step forward and say, uh, I'm going to take a risk, I'm going to speak truth to power, and we're going to change uh, and transform the discussion in a very significant way. I want to ask you today to think with that spirit in mind. Uh, not Nixon going to China literally, but we have a president and a secretary of education who at significant risk to their own power center have said they have come to the conclusion after many months and years and decades of discussion that the country needs to move forward in certain ways with respect to education reform. Uh, the work that you see in the race to the top process and the criteria that they set out in the race to the top process is not random, it is not arbitrary, it is a body of work that reflects much of, not all of, the best thinking as it relates to education reform in the modern era. I know this because over the last years and decades I served first of all in the Minnesota House on the, one of the education committees, but more recently I have been the co-chair of the ACHIEVE organization. I have been a chairman of the National Governors Association Education Committee. I recently ended up the, the chair of the Strategic Management of Human Capital Initiative and Task Force in Education. I'm currently the co-chair of the Education Commission of the States. I sit on the advisory board of the Milken Foundation for the Teacher Advisory Program, the TAP Program, and many other similar organizations. I, like you, I have sat in countless education meetings where the same issues have been discussed uh, ad nauseum for lots of years, and the consensus that has formed around what needs to be done, at least as to those things that are reflected in the race to the top criteria, uh, is a, in fact a movement, and I would go so far as to say it is a consensus, and it is the future. If you look at these criteria, it isn't going to be, I don't think, much longer before we're going to have a tipping point where first Tennessee and Delaware, next round five or ten more states, and then after that the laggards will join the parade uh, and get behind what these criteria are. So I think the question for Minnesota is, do you want to, do we want to continue with the spirit of innovation and pioneering change in the state, or do we want to be a laggard as it comes to embracing that change? Now again, uh, if I were to stand here and tell you as the Republican governor of Minnesota these things, you would say, well, it's just Pawlenty, you know, spouting off about education again. Uh, but this is now President Obama and Secretary Duncan, uh, Nixon going to China saying the status quo is not sufficient, we need transformational change, and we have very good people all across this country who spend a lot of time developing these criteria. 
So think what we will about various other aspects of this. If we want to race to the top, uh, then we need to square up with these criteria. They are not entirely objective. They have some subjectivity to them, but they are in large measure objective. And as we line up Minnesota's current law, current regulatory framework, and current uh, political will, it doesn't match up very well. And so I've asked our commissioner and this team to reconvene the stakeholder group today so we can discuss the changes that need to be made to square up to these criteria. Because if we don't, there isn't a lot of uh, sense, I don't think, in applying for round two or much likelihood of success. Asia is not racing us to the bottom educationally. They are racing us to the top, as are other parts of the world. And so we aren't going to be a successful nation of just 300 million people leaving a third of our team on the bench. And that's what we're doing. Uh, we have in this uh, time and era in which we live approximately one third of our students who do not graduate from high school as rigorously defined in a timely manner or at all. And so in a world where you must have a skill or you must have an education to meaningfully connect to the education of today and tomorrow, if we don't improve this system, if we don't improve this, uh, econ this, uh, these outcomes, it is not only going to put our nation at peril, it is an economic uh, crisis, it is a moral crisis, it is an educational crisis. You can't have a country of just 300 million people in a hyper-competitive global world and have a third of our people uneducated or unskilled and disconnected from the economy who become in whole or in part wards of the state and have that work morally, socially, educationally, economically, or otherwise. It just doesn't work. And so we can look back on whether it's President uh, Clinton, whether it was President Bush II, President Bush I, all of the call to action, all of the grand uh, claims about education, nation at risk, goals 2000, uh, uh, the, what's the latest one we had under Bush II, Alice? The, no, no child left behind. Uh, but all of this is spelled out in great work. Uh, one example of that is the Nat National Teaching Commission that Lou Gerstner chaired in the you know, 2004 era. If you haven't read that, it simply provides the blueprint of much of what we are see unfolding in a uh, race to the top. But let me just give you my view quickly of some of these challenges that lie ahead for Minnesota substantively. And I know that you're going to be discussing this throughout the morning, and we invite your input. Uh, we're going to collect this input and then ask the legislature yet this session to make changes to the laws that will allow us to meaningfully compete for race to the top. If they refuse to do that, we will un not likely proceed with another application. Uh, we're either going to square up and compete uh, or we're going to allow the uh, rest of the states to do what they're going to do. But we cannot meaningfully compete on the current legal structure that exists in Minnesota. So here are some of the things that were identified in the application for which Minnesota lost the most points. There are some other things as well, and Alice, uh, Commissioner Segrin and Deputy Commissioner Anderson will go through this in more detail with you and get your ideas about how to best address these. But here are the things for which we lost the most points. One is lack of alternative pathways into teaching. This is an issue that has floated around the nation and floated around Minnesota for decades. It is happening as we speak around the country, and it should be happening in Minnesota. We have two very mild and modest entries into this area through the form of what amounts to very narrow pilot projects that get approved on an ad hoc or case-by-case -case basis. That is not sufficient. I see Senator Bonoff here from the Senate. Thank you, Senator Bonoff, for the courage and for your diligence and persistence in uh, uh, introducing this passing it, I think, last year in the Senate, and at least having it pending this year in the Senate. It has to uh, pass the Senate and the House. Last year it got through a House committee, and it was killed uh, on the way to the floor. And uh, I won't go into the gory details about how it was killed, but it was killed in a very heavy-handed way at the last hours of this debate. This issue has to be addressed. It has to be addressed squarely. It has to be addressed candidly or our application is going to be harmed as a result. This is not rocket science. This is becoming an accepted uh, consensual point around the country, and this needs to pass. It is a matter of political will. It is no longer a matter really of even genuine debate in my view. A second one, which is even as challenging or difficult, again, not so much substantively, but politically, but we need to link performance of staff 
more aggressively and more robustly to student learning. The evaluations of the staff have to have a more robust and significant component attached to student learning. We have QComp in Minnesota. It's a good start, but it had to get watered down and diluted in order to get it passed. So we allow local unions and local school districts to negotiate what part of the compensation package will rise or fall depending on whether students are learning or not. Uh, sometimes districts take an aggressive approach, many times they do not. Sometimes it's a very modest variable in the overall scheme. When you look at Delaware, when you look at Tennessee, what you see is much more aggressive uh, measurements around student performance being linked uh, to outcomes. In that case, in one case, 35 percent of the evaluation based on student performance. In Minnesota, in the QComp model, it you know, lingers, uh, if it's there at all, to speak of numerically, it's more in the 5 to 15% you know, range with a few exceptions and lots of dilution uh, in it. So this has to be a much more robust model. It has to be more aggressive, and this factor in consideration has to get uh, more weight. Um, similarly, the third one, and these will be on a slide, you'll see a lack of definition of effective teachers and the distribution system around where teachers get assigned, how they get assigned, how effective teachers are defined. There's a lot under the hood for this discussion. I'll leave that to the commissioner. But we need a different and better definition of effective teaching, and we need the ability collectively to be able to assign teachers to the most challenged areas uh, based on their effectiveness and the needs of the students rather than many of the systems that we see across Minnesota currently in law or as a function of collective bargaining agreement. Uh, this next item is also relates to the pre preparation of teachers and principals. There's a whole agenda, again, initially outlined in the National Teaching Commission, but you'll you continue to see the debate unfold today in a variety of other ways around the way that we recruit teachers, the way that we train them, whether colleges of education are sufficiently robust, whether they are sufficiently demanding in terms of their uh, rigor, whether it be through methodology or subject matter mastery, what the exit requirements are, what the entrance requirements are, uh, and the like, and, and much more. But there is a whole cluster of issues. I see Peter Hutchinson here, my friend from the Bush Foundation, who is working um, very diligently on an agenda with the colleges of education in Minnesota and throughout the upper Midwest on these kinds of issues. And I hope, Peter, you'll share some of your insights in the discussion this morning. Uh, goes to the heart and soul of one of the key criteria of race to the top and really the heart and the soul of one of the key criteria for education reform uh, more broadly. Another one that we lost points for was a lack of clear authority for intervention in low performing schools. We can make an argument that maybe the commissioner has the authority to do this if uh, lawyers go have a good battle about the extent of the commissioner's authority, but it needs to be clear and it needs to be explicit and it needs to be direct. Minnesota law is not none of that in its current form. We would assert we have the authority, probably, but it's ripe for a lawsuit and it needs to be clarified, again, giving the commissioner uh, the authority to intervene for low into low-performing uh, schools. And then the last one is not so much a a uh, legislative matter, it's a political matter, and that is, and it's a policy matter, and it's a relationship matter. You have to have the support of the unions. And I see some of our union friends here this morning, and we appreciate you being here. Um, and so there has to be a, a, a resolution of these challenges uh, in a way that garners and deserves union support. Um, and that's many of these things that I've just gone through are not on the union's list of favorite things to do. And so there's some tension around these issues. We just put it on the table. Um, but if we don't get some resolution of these issues, we're not going to be able to successfully compete. And we don't get union support, even if we were to get resolution of the issues and where the unions objected strongly, the application would still be you know, in doubt or in question. And so we thank and appreciate our union uh, stakeholder partners for being here today. We appreciate that, but we have to get some resolution around these issues in a way that is at least acceptable uh, to the unions, uh, maybe not with great enthusiasm, but at least something that, that would show some progress and some tolerance uh, for some of these changes. There are other issues as well. I won't go through them all because that's the point of the meeting this morning. These are the main ones. Uh, that where we lost most of the points in the application. And again, I wanted to just come by and, and share with you that this state has a tradition of being first in education innovation. 
This is the first state in the nation with charter schools. It was the first state in the nation with open enrollment. It is the first state in the nation with post, uh, one of the first for post-secondary enrollment options. This is a state that has been known historically for pioneering, taking risk, taking chances. Not all of it's going to work. Some of it's going to have to be refined and adjusted. But it's very clear to me uh, that the leadership of President Obama, the leadership of Secretary Duncan, as it relates to these criteria, is a roadmap for the future of education reform in this country. Uh, they are taking great risk, I think, as Nixon did when he went to China to call out some of their most powerful supporters and constituencies and saying, you got to change. And it's one thing if it's coming from, again, the Republican governor. It's another thing if it's coming from President Obama and Secretary Duncan. So if you don't agree with me politically, I hope you will at least look at what they've identified as the criteria and say, how do we square up with that? Not because of what Pawlenty said, but because this is how we're going to be judged. And it's based on lots of good work, lots of good research, lots of good debate. And this is the conclusion the nation has reached as to where we need to go. And the only question for Minnesota is, it's, Minnesota's going to go here. As sure as we are gathered here this morning, I can guarantee you that some years from now, there is going to be performance linked, teacher evaluations and pay more robustly linked to student performance. I can assure you that some years from now, there is going to be alternative pathways into teaching. I can assure you that at some point in the future, we're going to have better, more robust, more aligned colleges of education with more rigorous entrance and exit requirements and expectations around subject matter mastery. And I can assure you that either through charter schools or otherwise, really good teachers are going to find the most challenged students and populations. The only question in this room is going to be, do you want to get dragged there or do you want to, get, do you want to lead to that point? I suggest we lead uh, because this is going to happen. It'll happen sometime in the next you know, three to ten years. Uh, not, and so now it's just a matter of timing. But I ask for your help. We need your help, not because of me or Alice. Well, we'll be gone by the time the money comes in in round two or nearly so. Some, the next governor and next commissioner can spend it. But I don't think Minnesota wants to be in a position where our laws and our rules are so out of date and so uh, backward leaning that we can't even meaningfully compete for round two of a national uh, application for race to the top. And so I please let go of the past and embrace what I think Secretary Duncan and President Obama have outlined as the future. And again, it isn't the be all and the end all. This isn't all that needs to be done. But these are six or eight key things that, mu that I think would add great value to our education system and the education debate in our state. So we ask for your help. We know that our application is going to have to change as well. So I've instructed the commissioner to reach out to everybody in the room to get your thoughts and ideas, um, and, and we need your help. We want to get this done, but it isn't going to get done under the current structure, and it's not going to be successful under the current structure, and that structure needs to change. Uh, so thank you for coming, and uh, Commissioner, I'll turn it back over to you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to keep my uh, remarks brief because we want to let uh, Deputy Commissioner Anderson come up here and actually go through the review with you of uh, the Delaware, Tennessee, and Minnesota models so that you can kind of get an idea of uh, what the winners did uh, to receive their, um, their monies. Uh, but first of all, I do want to welcome everyone, especially all of those who were part of the stakeholder groups before, uh, that spent many, many hours with us um, trying to put an application together. We really appreciate that. And so you have a history of what we do discussed and what we need to do to go forward. And so we're anxious to, to have that feedback. And then I want to welcome, there are many legislators here. We opened it up to all legislators. Uh, we welcome the media here today, too, so that we can really um, communicate to many, many people about what we're doing here in Minnesota and what we need to do in the future. Does anybody remember No Child Left Behind anymore? Uh, the governor even forgot. He had to be reminded, oh, that No Child Left Behind law. Um, Actually, Race to the Top, to me, looks like a, uh, No Child Left Behind is like a, a nice leisurely walk in the park on a Sunday afternoon compared to what we're doing with Race to the Top and the challenges that have been put before us. Uh, oh, maybe for the days of No Child Left Behind, we might be wishing for, huh? Um, but Race to the Top has challenged us 
to uh, confront more boldly the chronic achievement gap that we have here in Minnesota and indeed across the nation. And it's causing us to look at all of the systems and the human resources that can make or break a student's achievement success. At the heart of this system is an effective teacher and an effective principal. And how we can recruit, train, then place them, and then continually professionally develop them all the way through their career so that they are the most effective person in that classroom and in that building for the rest of their lives. You know, as we know, if a student has three ineffective teachers in a row, they never recover academically. We cannot let that happen to our children. But indeed, if they have three effective teachers in, the row, in a row, they can just do great things academically. So we need to ensure, and I think that is the heart and soul of Race to the Top, and how we do that is very, very important. I know that a lot of us, when we lost, Everybody immediately focused on the negatives and what we did wrong and what we need to do better and what was the, why did we do this or why didn't we do that. But I also want to remind you of the good things that we did get kudos for. We were told that our standards were par excellence, that our assessments were state of the art, that we had a QCOM framework that was going to allow us to really uh, build upon and link our students and our teachers together in a more effective way because we have a framework already in place that we need to scale up. We have charter schools. We were the birthplace of charter schools. We um, got the number one ranking this year uh, from the National Association of Charter Schools because of our laws with charter schools. And also our STEM work was recognized as some of the best in the nation. So we have a very, very good foundation. We can, we can tick off all of the things that we've done with our ACTs, six years of ACE, top ACT scores. Our TIMS results were phenomenal. But when you look at our NAEP results, They've been flat. We've stayed high in the nation, but we're just coasting. And our achievement gap continues to be really, really huge. We need to confront that, and we need to do that in very, very powerful ways. So today, we're going to look at the Race to the Top application. We're going to see where our strengths were and where our weaknesses are. And then hopefully, we're going to come together, and we're going to have a serious discussion today about what our next steps are. We will examine and we're going to confront those areas and hopefully we will come to some strong consensus. And I want to assure you that as your commissioner, I am committed to doing everything I can to help you and our state become a successful applicant for Race to the Top. So now I would like to bring um, Deputy Commissioner Anderson up here. She is going to actually go through a PowerPoint with you and do the comparisons of D uh, Delaware, Tennessee, and Minnesota. Then we're going to have a Q&A time so that you can just uh, get some of your basic questions answered uh, if you have some, uh, some things that you need clarified. And then the rest of the time is going to be spent actually brainstorming and coming up with some ideas and solutions so that we can move forward with the Race to the Top application. So it'll just take me one moment with technology. Actually, I need to get, get into the computer. Yeah. It'll just be one moment, please. Is somebody else's job? Oh, where is she? Where is she? 